All right, you probably didn't notice this morning I went through and I shuffled up the perusals just a little bit. So the perusal assignment that was due today is now due actually on Wednesday. Um, the one that was due on Wednesday moved to Friday um, because we're, we're basically behind by lecture. Um, so I've made some modifications there. So the good news is if you did the perusal assignment that was due today, you're done for Wednesday already. We do have an exam tomorrow. Remember, it's the postponed exam over chapters 18 through 21. I reviewed them a week ago today in, in preparation for the exam. Um, so make sure you go back and review those, those topics on electric force, electric charge, electric fields, electric potential, um, circuits, that whole thing. And you're going to crush the test, right? Yes, yes. Say yes. Be positive. You got to come into the test knowing that you're going to show up the teacher. Teacher thought that they put some questions there. They're going to test you and you're like, nah, I got this. Okay. Today we are going to continue with our magnetism. We're going to talk about the Hall effect, electric motors, and Ampere's law. Should time last. So we are going to have some WooClap questions. Make sure you get connected to WooClap. By now, it's probably getting pretty familiar. And I'll give you a few moments, but then I'll just go on because by now you should have this bookmark somewhere. <laughs> you see that every time. Okay, we do have four people in. Five. That's over half of the people here. It's a simple majority, six. Seven. Okay, I, I am gonna move on. Just remember wooclap.com, Fizz152. We're all but one are in already. So from last class period, I am sorry, I let the battery run out. I should have paid attention when Maxwell said, you're gonna make it, I don't think you're gonna make it. <laughs> um, so we worked a problem using forces on a wire due to current. Here's the steps to generally follow when doing those problems, such as in your homework. So the magnetic force is zero if, and you have the same three conditions as we had for a moving charge. If the current of the wire is zero, the wire is parallel to the magnetic field, or the magnetic field is zero. So you always want to check that first because why do any calculation if you can say right off the bat, oh, this force is zero. If it's not, then you determine, determine the angle between your length and magnetic field directions. How do you determine the length direction? I have a wire. Here's a come on, wire. Here is a wire. You can tell that the direction is horizontal, but which direction is it going? In the direction of the current, even though the current's not doesn't have a direction, technically. So you find the angle between those two. And then you find the magnitude of the force using force is equal to current times length perpendicular to the magnetic field or current times length times magnetic field perpendicular to the length or the way any normal person would do it. Just current times length times magnetic field times sine of the angle between the magnetic field and the current. That's force, right? Yes. And then finally, determine the direction with the right-hand rule. So I'm going to jump right into you guys working out a problem. A 125 meter long power line is horizontal. So this is the power line. I will actually give it a color here for you so it stands out. There's a wire and it has current of 2,500 amps toward the south. The Earth's magnetic field is shown here and its completeness has a magnitude of 0 0.052 millitesla. What's the magnetic force on the power line? Do the units of the magnetic field need to be in Tesla again? Always. Always in Tesla.
It's your Teslas. Got to get a student chance. Okay, so it looks like we have lots of different answers. So, yeah, they're, they're close, but if they're not the same, there's something wrong. So our equation was the magnitude is equal to ILB sine of theta. So I is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the third amperes. L is equal to 125 meters. B is equal to 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5 Teslas. Remember, milli is minus 3. And theta, what is the definition of theta? The angle between what and what? Angle between the... The current and magnetic field. So the angle between these two. So some people might go ahead and say 118 degrees. Other people might say, well, what about 62 degrees? Sine of 118 is equal to sine of 62. So it doesn't matter which one you use. Either one will give you the same answer. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so now we just put those numbers in our calculator. So the force magnitude is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the third amperes times 125 meters times 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5 teslas times sine of, I'm going to put 118 degrees just because technically that's the angle between the two. I don't know. Did you get a different answer this time? What is it? I got 14.3. Okay, we had two people. That means they're right. 14.3. Now in terms of units, the Tesla is the tricky one. So the, the way I actually remember the Tesla is by the units of this equation. The Tesla is the Newton per amp meter. So if I replace Tesla with a Newton over an amp meter, well then the unit cancellation becomes obvious. Oh, yeah. and, and if you look up the unit for the Tesla, that is what it shows you. It says either Newton um, per Coulomb meter per second or per amp meter. Coulomb per amp, or Tesla, Newton per amp meter. So, it comes out to be units of newtons. Okay. Now that's that's, super simple. that's half the answer. What's the other half of the answer? Direction. The direction. And then the units of the square. That's what you said. <laughs> okay. So why don't you lead everyone through the two two? Oh, okay. Ah, ah, ah. Give me base here and index figure. Oh, point three zero point three zero. Right hand people, because sometimes I do the left hand. That's an issue. Anyway, right hand, uh, index finger towards the current, and then your middle finger points towards the B direction, and then wherever the problem is. So if that's north and south, yeah. then I assume this is east and that's west, and uh -huh. so it'd be in the easterly direction. Yes, easterly direction. 
It's like that. All right, let's move forward. And any questions about this before we move forward? Any questions? I thought that everything had to be orthogonal. That what? Everything had to be orthogonal. Well, 90 degrees. the answer has to be orthogonal to the two things in the cross product. Oh, and you, you can't force the two things in the cross product to be perpendicular to each other. But if they're parallel, the answer is zero because you have no perpendicular. Okay, the Hall effect. The Hall effect is a useful effect that we use to measure things like what charge is the charge carrier in a wire? What is your answer? What, char what charge is the charge carrier in a wire? Positive or negative? If I have current going through a wire, there's actual charges moving. Are those positive or negative charges? Negative. Positive or negative. Right, the positive doesn't move, it's the negative. The negative is the thing that's moving. We talk about current as the flow of positive charge, but in reality, it's negative charge. Using the Hall effect, we can determine that in some semiconductors, it's actually positive charge carriers. And when you're like, how could you have a positive charge carrier if you can't have the protons moving? You're right. We call them holes. The holes are atoms missing an electron. In a semiconductor, you have electrons hop this way so that you have the whole, the missing electron moves continuously like that, and that's the charge carrier. So in some semiconductors, it is positive charge carriers. The thing that's moving continuously is the whole. Yes. Now, if you have something like a gas or a fluid, in the fluid, you can have positive charge carriers and negative charge carriers. Okay, so what is the Hall effect? The Hall effect is something we could use to, for instance, measure the flow rate of blood in, in a vein without cutting you down and, and breaking the vein. I say without cutting you down. What you need to do is you need to put that vein in a, in a magnetic field, and then if you have ions in the blood, those ions are going to feel a force due to moving in the presence of a magnetic field. And that force will make them move so that you will have, if the magnetic field is shown here and the velocity is in that direction, if I have a positive charge carrier, what direction is, remember the equation, what direction is the force on a positive charge carrier with that V and that B. Okay, if V is going to your right, right. magnetic field, what does the X mean? Into. So the force is up. So you have V cross B up. Wait, why is it saying? Wait, so why are there two conflicting, oh, one's positive, one's negative? What does that have to do? Um, because in the blood, you may have some positive charge carriers, you may have some negative blood charge carriers, because it's a fluid. Right. right, so you've got positive ions and negative ions both flowing with the blood. And so because one is negative and the other is positive, they have to have opposite. Uh, right, because the negative one, you have a negative Q out front. That's right. And so that's going to reverse the direction. So positive charge goes up, negative charge goes down. But what does that do? That makes your blood vessel essentially behave like a capacitor. Now, we're going to treat your blood vessel like it is a parallel plate capacitor. Clearly, it's not, right? It's roughly cylindrical in shape. Mm -hmm. But we're going to treat it as if it's a parallel plate capacitor. And so if it was a parallel plate capacitor, we would have an electric field that is set up because of those charge separation, positive charge on top, negative charge on bottom. And so we would have electric field is equal to the voltage difference multiplied by the separation, the diameter of your blood vessel. And if we have equilibrium, right, you're going to have charge move to the top and bottom until the electric field is strong enough to make it so charged particles pass and don't have a net force. If they have a net force, they're going to move to the walls. 
And so you reach equilibrium where they no longer have a net force, otherwise you continue to build forever. And in that case, you have the electric force QE is equal to the magnetic force QVB. And so that means the electric force must be the speed multiplied by the magnetic field. And so you can measure the voltage directly by putting a little probe on there on either side of the, the vein. And you can measure the diameter of the vein or, or artery. I think you generally use this on an artery, not a vein. <laughs> and so then you can put that, you can calculate the electric field based on the voltage. You can put that into here. You know the external magnetic field. You can find the speed at which the blood is flowing through the blood vessel. Pretty cool, isn't it? Yes. Um, no. The, the, the original equation is this equation right here. And so then you substitute the magnitude of the electric force is QE. The magnitude of the magnetic force is QVB. And cancel the Qs. You could have done V is equal to E over B. So this is actually fundamentally the Hall effect. Now the Hall effect, we usually call it the Hall effect when we are using a probe to measure magnetism or the magnetic field in a region. Because with the Hall effect, you make a probe, you make it out of a semiconductor, you know its dimensions, and you measure that Hall voltage now, notice this here says you can find the drift velocity as well. That's not really what I've ever been concerned with. It's the magnetic field that is, if you have the probe, your probe is like this, has some thickness, some width, and you're usually trying to measure the magnetic field that is the component that's going like this. And so you put a known current through there and then you measure the, the voltage that is produced. And from the same calculation we just did, then you can determine what the strength of the magnetic field is. And that magnetic field would be the component that's normal to the surface as shown in my picture. So it would still be um, plug this into there. B is equal to the D is a physical parameter. You know what that is because you made the Hall of Pro. The V is also a physical parameter based on, well, actually, let, let's just do it again and do it with force magnet is that form or B perpendicular. I'm just going to put B perpendicular and set that equal to And so then you have change E with V over D. You have B perpendicular is equal to VQ over DIL. And so that's how you get the magnetic field with a Hall, a Hall probe. It's, well, it's a way we can measure magnetic fields. New question. This is why we connected up to, to WooClap. What direction is the net force on the loop shown right here? And WooClap is now open for you to answer.
sorry, opened up again because only four answered in the first time period. Hey, we got eight in. All right, everyone's answered. We have, yeah, I went forward instead of, there we go. Zero, zero, two, one, zero, zero, six. Okay, the majority has it. The net force, the picture has the forces shown with blue arrows. One is pointing up. How do you get that? The right hand rule. The current is going out of the picture. Out is out is the direction of the current there. So this would be out. So if I orient my hand, so current is coming out, magnet field to the right, thumb points up. Here, current is going the opposite direction, thumb points down. So they're opposite directions, same current, same length, so it adds up to zero. What about this side? What's the force here? They're parallel to zero. They're parallel to zero. They didn't even show arrows. And the goal is not to sit there and calculate, it's to recognize, hey, they're parallel, it's zero, move on. Okay, so the net force is zero. Makes this useless, right? Probably not. Probably not. When we learned about equilibrium, we learned some of the forces is zero, so there's no acceleration. But that's not all of equilibrium. What's the other part? Some of the torques is zero. So what's the net torque in the same situation? So now the wood clap question. Again, right? Yes. All but one have answered. Okay, we've got our last answer. So our answers are. Eight people said the net force is zero. Or I should have changed that to torque, but okay. Yeah, so I changed that here. It's good. Net torque is zero. If the net torque was zero, then David's first answer should have been a guiding point. I feel like it's zero, but then it would be useless. If the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques is zero, then it's useless to us. But the torques are not zero. Now, this shows the torques with the green arrows. Torques are things that make it rotate. It's not showing the torque vector. It's showing the direction to make it rotate. The equation for torque is R cross F. This is going back to first semester. So we have two forces. For each force, we have to calculate the torque. So if we take force four, what direction, well, first thing we have to identify is the axis it rotates about. Can you identify the axis that this rotates about? Uh, that center one down in the middle, beyond that. This axis here is the axis of rotation. The R vector is the vector that goes from the axis of rotation to where the force acts. So for force four, force four is equal to the length of that, which is A times the current times the magnetic field times, in this case, sine of 90 degrees. There's force four. 
R4, if you look at the picture, I covered over, but B was the distance from here to here. So what is the distance for R4? For R4? Yeah. If, also no, because B is going from here to here, and we want to go from the center line. It's B over 2, and notice I put an arrow on it for the direction. It goes from the axis to where the force acts. So what is the magnitude of torque 4? It's a cross product. You're multiplying the perpendicular parts. What's the angle between R4 and F4 here? It's what? It's 90 degrees. It's a right angle. And so that means they're perpendicular to each other. So it's just the magnitude is just going to be R4, B over 2, times F4, But then I also need its direction. So how do we find the direction for a cross product? With the right hand rule. What direction should my index finger point? The direction of which one? The direction of the first item in the cross product. So the first item in the cross product is R. So the red one, yes. So my index finger needs to point that direction, and then I need to orient my hand so my middle finger can point in the direction of the second vector, and my thumb is pointing into the screen. And so torque for vector has its direction in. <laughs> well, I guess we know which one answered that question. Okay, what about torque two? Torque 2 is going to be the torque caused by this force. R is like this, right? R is in the opposite direction. It's also into the screen. So that's also going to be equal to... Yes. <laughs> Now, if we add these two together, which is why I forgot the two, if we add these two together, what do we get for the total torque? Uh, B times two quantity, everything is at the so that's not. So, AB over two times two is AB. Wait, hold on, hold on. In your first equation, only B is over two. Um, well, Anything in the numerator is over anything in the denominator. So if I add those two together, I get AB times I times B times sine of 90 degrees. Geometrically, AB is the area of that rectangle. Now, I did not prove this, but it turns out that's always the case. It's always going to be... the area enclosed, or the area of the loop. So as a general rule, torque is equal to magnetic field times area times current times sine, and I'm going to put sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the area to the loop. So the area to the loop if my paper is the loop, that is, the loop's going like this, what direction is, I said perpendicular, normal to that area? Up. Oh. Oh. What if it rotates like this? Oh. Right. So it, it can rotate as this rotates. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it, it could. You, you have to set your signs accordingly. Because this is a paper, your side could be considered going out. So here's a general rule. Now, this had one loop. If I doubled the number of loops, if I had two loops, then I would double each force, which means I would double the torque. So if I have n loops, I'm going to have n times the torque. So here's our equation for the torque magnitude. 
created by having current go through a loop in the presence of a magnetic field. NBA, I put it in this order because we all remember NBA, times the current times sine theta. Uh, what's N again? N is the number of loops. Okay. And in this case, it's only one. In this case, it's only one, correct. All right. So here is the written out in not my handwriting, but type, typed um, calculation. It doesn't have the sine theta on here yet because it's saying, okay, in this orientation, which is your maximum torque orientation, then you have N, and this is not made by me, hence it doesn't have an order of NBAI. But if it's at another angle, if it's not in that flat orientation, now we have less torque because the angle between the normal to the surface and the magnetic field is at 90 degrees. And so that's going to lower the torque. So in general, once again, it's not the way I ordered the MBAI, but that's our general equation for the torque on a magnetic loop. Now, how is this useful? Well, we use it to make electric motors. You buy yourself a Volt or a Tesla or, you know, an electric vehicle, and you have electric motors that are generating their torque using this process. Now, something just kind of off topic, but still I think really important. Electric motors are very torquey. What does it mean if I say it's torquey? Okay, torquey is a, a geeky word. It means it twists a lot. It has a lot of twisting force or torque. What that means is when you press on the gas in an electric vehicle, you're actually getting a bigger acceleration in, in the first instant than you would with a normal internal combustion engine car. And that makes your tires so they don't last as long as an electric vehicle because they torque your engines. But those electric vehicles will basically have top acceleration until you reach near top speed. And then it drops off. So that's kind of cool. Let's do an electric motor problem. An electric motor is made using the Earth's magnetic field. Oh, we're smart here. And a 9-volt battery. So the terminal voltage, and I looked this up. Believe it or not, rechargeable 9-volt batteries, there's one kind with a terminal voltage of 9.6 volts, and all the rest are between 7 and 8.5 and volts. So rechargeable 9 volts may not be a good replacement for a 9-volt battery. I think that's why some things will say don't use rechargeable in them. Okay, so we have a 9-volt battery. We have circular coils with a radius of 2.54 centimeters. And we have a total resistance in the motor of 12 ohms. Actually, this should depend on the number of loops, but I didn't want to make the problem too hard. And we want a maximum torque of 50 millinewton meters. <laughs> Am I funny or what? Nobody's laughing at the way I put the units. Okay. A maximum torque of 50 millinewton meters. How many coils? What does N have to be? I mean, it does say it in the question, but being very blunt, what is N? The number of coils. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so calculate the number. What's the equation for torque? Uh, NBA sine theta. NBA I. NBA I sine theta. And we want maximum, so sine theta is just going to be one. Just the number of trips is what we're looking for. Oh. Um, 
Given the voltage and the resistance, what do we need that break? It is a ridiculous number because we're using a very new magnetic field. Okay, well then I won't be Yeah, concerned. I'm trying to figure out the area. You have a circle, what's the area of the circle? I'm just yeah, okay. That's why we have a lower enough case R's separate. That's a lot of points. Okay, I think we're pretty much done here. We have some discrepancies, most of them calculator. So let's do this. That way, if you made a mistake, you can see where it happened. So I'm looking for N. I have torque max is equal to 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5. Or that was B. I'm, B is equal to 5.0 to 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. And I have A is equal to pi r squared, where r is equal to 2.54 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, otherwise known as an inch. And i is equal to Ohm's law of V over r. And I'm just going to put that in 
V is 9.0 volts and R is 12 ohms. And so if I solve this for N, And for I put V over R, I put the R on top because divide by in a fraction. So then we just put in our numbers of, oh, I didn't write over here torque max. Millinewton meter, so times 10 to the minus 2 newtons times meters. Resistance of 12 ohms, magnetic field, two point five four times ten to the minus two. Oops, forgot to put my meters squared, and nine point oh volts. So you put that all in your calculator, and it should give you. Six hundred and sixty thousand turns. I rounded it to two sig figs because that's how many sig figs I have in the problem. In the end, did we all get that number? Close. So this was, I mean, it was almost a plug and chug problem, but you did have to use areas pi r squared and Ohm's law. Right, you have to recognize how these things fit together. So we know that if I have a magnet in the magnetic field, one of the very first things we saw was that if the magnet's in the magnetic field, it rotates to align. The magnets will always have a torque to try to align, so magnetic field goes into the south and out of the north. And so the fact that in our electric motor, well, how far back do I have to go? In our electric motor, there was a torque to try to make these. So ideally, it would line up like this. So the magnetic field and the area are pointing the same direction. Indicates that our, our loop must be behaving like a little magnetic dipole. It has a north side and a south side. It's trying to align so the external magnetic field goes into the south side and comes out of the north side. So this leads us to the idea that if I have a wire with current going through it, it might make a magnetic field. Now, historically, the way that was determined was through accident. It's the best way to discover anything in science. So uh, now I can't remember his name. Um, Orsted, something or other, Hans Christian Orsted was preparing to give a lecture and he had his wires out there to run electricity to something. And so before the demonstration, he's gonna to check to make sure it works. So that's my best effort to try to be like Hans Christian Orsted. So he turns on the power. And he saw the magnet or the compass move. And he's like, ooh, that wire must be making a magnetic field. Yay! And so that was the beginning of understanding we can make magnets with wires and, and electric current. So what we just saw with the electric motor is really an extension of that. So uh, I, I forgot. I'm not done with this. That, that one slide was apparently out of place. Um, I thought I was going into Alpner's law there, but I have a question first and two or three more slides. How can an electric motor continue to operate? Okay, you can answer starting. Whoops, <laughs> you can't answer. Apparently I didn't put this in the presentation. How can an electric motor continue to operate with a DC battery powering it? Right, how can it get to that position with, you know, sine theta is theta zero degrees, sine theta is zero, no torque. How can you make it continue to go around? 
So you got to blur. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> yes, there is no such thing as a flux capacitor. That was something made up for Back to the Future. And true story, Great Scott, was it 1.22 gigawatts or something like that? No one on set knew how to pronounce giga, and so they just made it up. <laughs> and that's how they ended up with gigawatts. <laughs> It is kind of easy, but you're not dealing with people who ever took a science class. I mean, except for Doc. Doc should have been in a science class, right? He should have. Okay, so, and he's, of course, the one who says it. But the answer is a DC motor on its own. I mean, it wouldn't work if you just wired it up the way we showed. And so there's two ways of doing it. One is make an AC motor. The other way we call a split armature which is what David guessed. I don't know, maybe you knew. I guessed. So what does the split armature look like? It looks like this. You have these coils. <laughs> you have these coils, and you have the wires going to the coils, but you make the wires connect to landing pads here. And then you have electric brushes. Yes, I know those look like solid pieces of metal, because they are. But we call them brushes, whether it's a solid piece of metal or whether it looks like a brush. And so as that armature, the cylinder, rotates, the connections to the wire split from one wire to the other. So which side is positive, the left side or the right side? Um, the, right. the right is positive because the long side is always positive. That's beneficial for tomorrow's test. <laughs> and so the current right now in this picture, the current is flowing into this wire that's on the bottom part. So right now in this picture, the current is flowing into here, going around all the loops, and then flowing back there. But if it rotates and continues to rotate, then it will switch to this pad, and the current will flip directions. And so you make it so every time you get to zero torque, it flips the direction of the current, and then as it continues going around, the torque makes it continue. So that's how you make a DC motor, and I guess a galvanometer is an example of using the same idea as an electric motor, except for we have a spring opposing it. Measure how much torque you create, and that tells you how much current there was. Okay, what am I saying? I still got time left. Three, two, have a great day. I'll see you for the test tomorrow. You'll see me earlier.